Welcome to note set number 10, where we're going to start getting into uh, using Fourier analysis rather than Z-transform analysis. Um, so we've already alluded to the fact that uh, uh, the Z-transform is a more powerful version of uh, the f DTFT, um, and that there are some, it provides some tremendous insight uh, that the DTFT does not. Um, however, there are times when we want to use the DTFT because it uh, provides a different uh, insight than, than what we can get in the Z-transform. So they each have their uses, and uh, really the one place where the uh, DTFT really shines is um, application to signals, not for the purpose of trying to figure out how they go through a system, but just um, trying to find out what they consist of, or identify a characteristic, or um, classify one signal from another. Um, so a lot of signal processing uh, boils down to um, not necessarily processing a signal through an LTI system, although a lot of that does happen, uh, but a lot of digital signal processing boils down to taking a signal or a, a 2D version like an image and processing it uh, to, to do something to it um, or to characterize it or to identify or detect. Um, am I seeing a signal embedded in noise coming from a particular type of submarine uh, or something like that? And, and that's the, the um, area where the Fourier transform shines and the Z transform really has no business being involved in that. Uh, now, I'm, I'm pointing out here that uh, we are covering um, sections 4.2 and 4.4 of Proacus and Monolacus, but I'm also pointing out that uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff in Chapter 4 that should be review, and I'm uh, expecting that you will read through that uh, entire chapter uh, to refresh your memory. And I'm only going to focus on a few topics that uh, you probably haven't seen before. <clears throat> so a few new things, uh, and then the, the old things in Chapter 4 are things that you should read through and, and just refresh your memory on. So one thing that I did not cover in my Signals and Systems class, uh, and, and there's a couple reasons for it, uh, for, for not having covered it, uh, is the discrete time Fourier series, DTFS. For, for one reason I didn't cover it was, I mean, we already had enough Fourier things going on uh, to, and to add in one, one more would just muddy the waters even further. Uh, secondly, um, it's actually less common to get periodic signals in the discrete time world, um, at least perfect periodic signals in the discrete time world. And if you think about it this way, um, in order, think carefully about this, if you start off with a continuous time periodic signal and then you sample it, you don't necessarily get a discrete time periodic signal. You only get a discrete time periodic signal if the um, period of the continuous continuous time signal is an integer multiple, perfect integer multiple of your sampling interval. Then a continuous time periodic signal will get sampled and become a discrete time periodic signal. So the chances of that actually happening are, are pretty slim. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, you can sometimes create periodic signals <coughs> uh, inside your discrete time signal or inside, inside your discrete time processing system, uh, and so, uh, you know, to use, and, and therefore it's worthwhile knowing how to analyze those, um, if for no other reason than to just be able to, to work some, some mathematics to understand how everything's going to work. So basic, basically the same idea as, as for continuous time periodic signals. We've got some signal X of N, and it's periodic if... Um, uh, with, with period N, capital N, if, if we can write this uh, result, and that, that result holds true for all values of, of little n. Uh, I made this set of notes a long time ago, and just now I'm getting to, uh, around to, to recording the videos, uh, 
Uh, I honestly can't remember if I had a reason for putting that little underline under the little end there. Um, it could just be a typo for all I know. Um, I, right now I, I, I'm blank as to why I would have put that there. So anyway, just ignore it. Um, so we have a period of capital N samples. And so if we take 2 pi and divide it by uh, the, the period, uh, we'll get in the units of radians per sample, 2 pi over N radians per sample would be the fundamental frequency. So once we've set all that up, um, you know, if you remember for the, the CT Fourier series, we were decomposing a periodic signal into a sum of complex sinusoids where the frequencies were integer multiples of some fundamental frequency. So we now have a fundamental frequency for the discrete time case, and we're going to do the same kind of thing. We're going to expand our periodic signal in terms of um, complex sinusoids with frequencies that are integer multiples of the fundamental. But the big difference here is that um, unlike in the continuous time Fourier series where those frequencies make sense to uh, have them keep getting larger and larger and larger, in the discrete time world, uh, once you get above um, pi, you're really wrapping back around to negative pi values. And, and remember we're talking about uh, you know, we normally think about our DTFT as going from minus pi to pi. Um, so we really don't have to go outside of that range. Uh, now, keeping in mind that minus pi to pi is actually the same as 0 to 2 pi, we can play a little trick just to make uh, the, the uh, notation easier. So we're going to let our frequencies go from 0 up to just shy of 2 pi. So here's the frequencies of interest. Uh, we're going to let k go from 0 out to n minus 1. So notice that if we plug uh, k equal to n minus 1 in there, we get n minus 1 over n, which is just shy of 1 um, times 2 pi. So we, we don't go all the way to 2 pi because that's exactly the same as um, at uh, k equal to 0. Um, so, and we don't want to repeat. So uh, so that's the scenario here. Uh, and just keep in mind that all those frequencies that are above pi um, can really be interpreted as the negative frequencies, um, you know, the corresponding negative frequencies. So remember, we are now thinking about our um, unit circle. We've got our complex Z plane. And, and remember, the, the discrete time for a transform is angles around this unit circle. So if we start over here, we're at plus or minus pi. Um, and so if we think about starting here at minus pi and going around through zero to plus pi, that's one way to think about it. Um, but we could also think about starting here at zero and going all the way around and coming back around to two pi, uh, which is what we're thinking about here. But remember, once we get over to here, to those values that are above pi, it's the same as coming back uh, in a negative direction. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing here. It's just more convenient to write it out this way than to have plus and minus uh, frequencies. But you could write it out that way too. Um, so um, the, uh, the discrete time Fourier series uh, has these coefficients out in front that are amplitude and phase of each of these um, components. And so to find those, um, we use a formula that is almost identical, uh, just a discrete time version of what we had for uh, the continuous time for a series. Um, and we can also verify that C of K plus N uh, is equal to CK. Um, so not only does the signal itself have a periodic nature, but the Fourier series coefficients themselves also have um, a periodic nature. Um, so we have uh, compare, to co compare and contrast here uh, the um, uh, discrete time Fourier series versus the discrete time Fourier transform. 
so um, the, the biggest distinction is actually in uh, the inverse. So um, here we're building a, a periodic x of n from a linear combination of finite discrete frequencies. And here we are building over a continuum of frequencies. So the same idea that we, or the same distinction that we saw between the continuous time Fourier series and the continuous time Fourier transform. Um, we would also like to point out that finding the DTFT versus finding the Fourier series coefficients looks an awful lot alike, um, but this is a finite sum, this is an infinite sum, so there are issues for convergence of the DTFT, but no issues of convergence for the DTFS. Uh, and this table 4.3.1 out of the textbook just gives a nice characterization and points out an interesting thing, um, which, which I summarized down here, that um, there are links between the two domains as far as periodicity and um, discreti <laughs> discretization. So if we have periodicity with period alpha in one domain, it's that periodicity in that domain that creates discretization in the other domain. Um, and, and that discretization is with a spacing of 1 over the the period in the in the original domain and we can see that here so if we look at periodic signals will be in um, in this upper half and we have the continuous time and the discrete time version of those um, so we have uh, uh, let me get rid of some of this stuff here uh, all right um, so we have here uh, continuous and periodic uh, in, in the time domain, and we have discrete and periodic in the time domain. And notice that for both of those, because we have periodic in the time domain, we have discrete in the frequency domain. Uh, and then likewise, if we think about um, periodic in the um, frequency domain. So here we have periodic in the, in the frequency domain and we end up discrete in the time domain. And here we have periodic in the frequency domain. Uh, so this is the discrete time uh, Fourier series. So periodic in the frequency domain and we have discrete in, in the time domain. So um, it's nice to kind of see this connection, uh, and it kind of explains that, you know, these aren't all uh, extremely different from each other. They're actually very similar to each other. So this is a good place to kind of refer back and just kind of stare at it for a while and let it soak in. So um, we'll, setting aside the uh, Fourier series, uh, and talking a little bit about the DTFT, some aspects of it that we didn't address in the signals and systems class. So we've been talking about issues of convergence. You know, since this is an infinite sum to find the DTFT, we have to worry about um, the convergence, and and that was addressed partly through um, the region of convergence for uh, the Z transform. But let's take a look and see um, what kinds of convergence we're actually talking about here. So let's define a truncated version of the DTFT. So we're only going from minus capital N up to plus capital N. Um, so once we have though th that idea, um, you know, mathematicians have come up with a lot of different ways to characterize convergence. Uh, and, and one of those is what's known as uniform convergence. So if we look at this partial sum and look at how it converges to this final answer um, as we let n, capital N, get bigger, 
we would say that we have uniform convergence. We're not saying that we do get this. We're just saying here's a concept called um, uniform convergence, and, and then we'll look to see when, when we can get that. Uh, so uniform convergence means that over all values of omega, um, that you know, the, the, the difference between the truncated DTFT and the true DTFT keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller over all values. And the way that we handle that is we say, well, let's look at the biggest, and that's what this soup does, uh, or supremum. Uh, so we can just roughly think about that as maximum. So what we're doing is we're saying find the biggest error over all frequencies and look at what happens to that biggest error. If that biggest error goes to zero, then all the errors will go to zero, and that's what we mean by uniform convergence. Um, and so to kind of see how that plays into things here, um, we... S we uh, you know, saw that a sufficient condition uh, is absolute summability. So uh, the, the DTFT converges uniformly if we have absolute summability on the uh, time signal X of N. And so now we know what condition we need in order to make um, this, this uniform convergence happen. But it, it turns out that a lot of the signals that we're interested in are so-called energy signals, and they are square-summable. So you have to have a square here on the magnitude before you sum things up. And if that sum is less than infinity, then we say that the, the signal is square-summable. Um, but square-summable actually uh, defines energy signals, and it turns out that... Um, not all energy signals are absolutely summable. Um, so there are some signals that are both absolutely summable and square summable, um, but there are some that are only square summable and not absolutely summable. So, um, so this idea of uniform convergence ends up being uh, a bit too elusive for, for us to, to make any from. So we then talk about mean square convergence. So um, we define a new thing. We say that if our truncated uh, transform uh, minus the actual function that it's aiming at, uh, if we look at the difference between those, take the magnitude squared, integrate that, and then as n goes to infinity, look to see if that area um, goes to zero. Um, the area of the squared error, see if that goes to zero. If it does, then we say that they converge uh, in, in mean square, or they have mean square convergence. Now, what could happen is, um, even though, you know, we've seen with the delta function, uh, that goes to um, uh, unit area, even though... Um, you know, it goes to zero almost everywhere, but at one point it, it grows without bound um, for the delta function. So it's possible that this error here could um, achieve this um, converging mean square to zero, but there would be um, points, or values of omega for which uh, this thing never actually becomes this. And we can illustrate this with the DTFT of a sync function. Um, so if we just take a, a few terms, we start getting things like this. Uh, and we see that as we go to more and more terms, actually the, the, the maximum error stays the same. Uh, I'm not quite drawing it correctly, uh, you know, with, accurately with my, with my pen here. Um, but no matter how big we get, uh, that little peak there never gets smaller. Um, so clearly we do not have uniform convergence, um, but this does satisfy uh, mean square convergence. Um, so this, this thing that, peak, that sticks up here uh, doesn't keep getting higher, but uh, you know, the, the area underneath that keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and that little blip uh, ends up having a width that goes to zero uh, 
Um, so we end up with um, a, a finite height and a width that goes to zero, so we, we get the area that goes to zero. So these are a few subtlety things that you know don't show up an awful lot, but you should be at least a little bit aware of them um, as you read some DSP literature. Uh, we've already talked about this, but I threw it in here because it's in the book in this section. Um, but this is just pointing out once again this idea that the Z-transform and the DTFT are related. And in fact, the DTFT is just an embedding, is embedded in the Z-transform uh, on the unit circle. And so if the region of convergence includes the unit circle, um, then we can... Um, pull the DTFT out of the out of the Z transform, um, uh, but I would like to point out that uh, you know there are some weird signals, quote unquote weird signals, um, that have DTFT that um, but don't have Z transform. So the sync function is is one such function. So again, just you know, kind of a little stupid trivial trivia point. Um, so this is just an illustration similar to one that I had done uh, earlier showing the relationship between the Z-transform and the DTFT. So here's the Z-transform magnitude on the Z-plane, um, and then we cut around the unit circle and we get something like this. And you can see these little dimples here are places where we've tacked it down to zero, and you can see where those points are um, on the unit circle. Then we cut here uh, at the plus and minus pi point and we unfold our Burger King crown and we um, get the DTFT plotted on a, on a linear axis. So, so we've seen this already but I, I threw it in just because it's kind of a neat um, a neat uh, diagram. I, you know, I like the, the little dimples showing the zeros and then you can kind of see where the zeros end up on the plot. Um, okay, so um, there are times when we do uh, allow poles on the unit circle um, which and still end up being able to talk about a DTFT even though strictly the uh, uh, unit circle wouldn't be included in, in the region of convergence in this case. And so one specific example of this would be um, the unit step function. Uh, we can find its Z transform this way, and we can see that it has a pole right on the unit circle. Um, and so technically, we can't really extract the DTFT out of it, and we'll see here that we can't really do that using the rule, or only the rule that we learned. If we apply the rule that we learned, we would take this thing and we would convert it into only this term, um, but that loses uh, that idea, or, you know, we lose um, the, the, the poles at, at the origin, and so this term allows us to um, account for that. So again, I'm not going to stress this and dwell on it, but I just wanted to point out, you know, in passing, uh, a few of these little quirks and, 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 and things that uh, show up in, in the theory. So now we want to spend a little bit of time talking about some symmetry properties of the DTFT. These are useful tools for us when we're trying to develop algorithms and um, do test cases and things like that. Um, if we can wrangle these symmetry properties, we can often exploit them when we're um, developing algorithms. So, you know, a lot of this course, as is any course, really, is just kind of, you know, doing a bunch of stupid, quote-unquote, stupid tricks to kind of build your muscles and, you know, kind of drag you through some things that are illuminating uh, without really ever showing you, well, here's how you actually do such and such. Um, uh, partly that's because you know there's so many different things you can do with DSP um, that I you know we don't want these courses to just turn into a and, and so you do this like this and you do this like this um, we'd rather you know ha make sure that you grasp and master the fundamentals um, and then you can go off and figure out the new well to do this we do that 
Um, so, oh, so anyway, here's here's some symmetry properties. Um, and so these hold for, for the other Fourier tools as well, not just the DTFT. So um, we will, in general, allow our signal X of N to be complex in this section. Um, and we already know that, in general, the DTFT itself is is generally complex valued. So since we're allowing our signal X to be complex, uh, we need to notate it as a, a real part and an imaginary part. And likewise, even if we don't know what it is, we know that uh, the DTFT is also complex valued, so it will have a real and an imaginary part. So now we're, we take these two ideas and we fuse them together and uh, so we, we write out the expression for uh, the DTFT, and we just plug in the fact that we have uh, real and imaginary parts of the signal, and, and now we're going to write this out in terms of Euler's formula. And so now we have uh, real plus imaginary times real plus imaginary, so we, we do a lot of cross-multiplication, we'll get some terms that have no j's, some terms that have just one j, uh, some term that has a, a j times a j, and that goes away and becomes purely real. So if we if we wrangle all that, we can boil this down to um, this this kind of structure. So hopefully you can follow that through with j times j uh, turning into a, a, a negative and and so forth. So um, Given that our DTFT has real and imaginary parts, um, we can then say that XR will be this part of that equation. Uh, X sub i, the imaginary part, uh, can just be picked off to be that structure. Um, so we now have a, a way of saying, well, here's how I could write out the real part, here's how I could write out the imaginary part. So that, that's pretty straightforward. So, similarly, since we have um, x in the time domain being complex valued, um, we can uh, work out that x, the real part of x, must be equal to um, this expression, and the imaginary part must be equal to this expression. So, um, so we just have some nice general ways of linking the reals and imaginary, the real and imaginary parts in both domains with some specialized equations. So that's, that's what we're looking at here. But now we can use those to get specific results for some specific scenarios. So suppose we limit ourselves to real valued signals. Well, then the imaginary part is equal to zero, and x itself is just equal to xr. Um, so in that case, we start with this general result, but we know that this part goes to zero, and this part goes to zero, and so we're left with just xr is equal to a transform with respect to cosine, and x sub i is a transform with respect to sine, and there's a negative sign out in front. Um, so once we have that, we can then ask, well, uh, since this thing has only cosines in it, and cosine itself is an even function, if I replace omega by negative omega, I can exploit the evenness of cosine and show that the real part of the DTFT for real signals um, is, is um, an even function. And likewise, um, the imaginary part is an odd function. Uh, so there are some, some additional symmetry and, and characteristics that, that we can take advantage of. And so what that leads us to, if we kind of group these two things together, it leads us to this idea that the um, DTFT of real valued signals has what's called Hermitian symmetry. So if I conjugate it, it's the same as reversing it on the omega axis. Uh, and that's very easy to prove. Um, we can literally just plug in the negative W, plug it in here, but then use the fact that x sub r was even, um, and use the fact that x sub i was, was odd, and we end up getting uh, this result. 
And then once we have this Hermitian symmetry, we can easily see that that implies that the magnitude is even and the phase is odd. So this result is something that we've spouted off before, that for real value signals, the magnitude of the Fourier transform is even and the phase of the Fourier transform is odd. Um, and now we see why that actually holds, um, and we see that it requires that the signals be real valued. Uh, so now working it back the other way, if we plug in um, our two parts for the inverse DTFT, um, we can um, find out for, you know, for real signals we know this is true. Um, and so then we, we notice that we've got an even times an even, and we've got an odd times an odd. So both of these terms are even functions, and therefore we don't really need to integrate over the full range. We really only need to integrate um, over 0 to pi, then we multiply by 2, and that's why uh, we lose the 1 over 2 pi uh, to becoming just 1 over pi. Uh, so that's a nice, nice result that we can advantage of. So now let's say not only is our signal in the time domain real, but it's also even. So we've got results for real time domain signals that we can then take even farther. So now we look at this, we saw that um, xr of omega um, could be expressed this way, but now we know that x of n is, is even. So I have an even function times an even function. And so I can, um, you know, play the game where I, I only have to integrate, or sum in this case, over one side, um, and then I multiply by 2 to get that. And I have to handle the, the n equals 0 case separately. Um, and we can also recognize that um, we'll have x is even, sine is odd. So the, the product of even times odd is odd. And if we're summing up an odd function over all time, uh, it will go to zero. So we see that um, the when we have a real and even uh, time domain signal, we get a Fourier transform that's purely real and also even. Uh, now flipping it around and coming back, we can use all those same results. Um, we write it out like this and then recognize... Uh, you know, that we've basically um, have shown that this part is zero, so this all goes away, and we're left with just that term. So now we have an easy way for the case where um, the signal is real and even. We only need the real part of the DTFT. That's the only part that's non-zero. And we only have to integrate from zero to pi, and we put a one over pi out in front. So, uh, again, these are just simple uh, relationships to kind of have. We write them down, and at some point, they come in handy. All right, so that was real and even. We can do all the same kinds of things with real and odd time signals. Now we see that the real part of the DTFT goes to zero. Um, and so we can uh, find a simple way to compute the um, Fourier, uh, the DTFT in, in this case, using only um, sine waves um, to do the computation. Uh, and then, you know, given that we know that x of n is, is real in this case, um, we can play around with this result and, and end up getting that x of n can be found from this, this simple result. So again, uh, just some uh, simple relationships that you can kind of tuck away and pull out when needed. So if we have purely imaginary signals, we just did everything for purely real. Um, I'm not going to dwell on this. It's, it's kind of the flip side of everything. Um, so we can get some uh, you know, results that show you know, various symmetries, um, simplified results, and so forth for that case. Uh, and then we'll, we go to imaginary and even, imaginary and odd, and, and we get all these different cases. Um, and then find um, all of this is, is summarized in this nice figure, uh, as well as table 4.4 in the textbook. So a little bit of a whirlwind there at the end, but I don't want to bore you 
um, you know, just going over the same stuff again. It's literally the same ideas, just, you know, flipped around um, a, a little bit. And so thinking through that on your own is probably a good thing to do. All right, we'll see you in the next slide set.